then. Hello everyone, we're gonna um, just wait for people to join us in the webinar and get started soon. So we're just waiting for people to file in, but thank you for joining us today. So good evening book lovers. Thank you for joining us for what I know will be an illuminating conversation with Sarah Blanchard and Misasha Suzuki Graham host of the popular Dare White Women podcast, and now authors of the new Dare White Women book. My name is Grace, and I'm the events producer for University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington, the oldest indie bookstore in this region. In fact, we're celebrating our 121st anniversary this year, and we wouldn't be here if not for the support of you all. So a heartfelt thank you to each of you. Providing expert behind the scenes tech support today is fellow bookseller Dan, who'll be adding links of the books to the chat as the event progresses. And we'd love to hear where you're zooming in from, so please let us know in the chat as well. Sarah and Misasha will be in conversation with Dr. Anu Taranath and talking to us about their new book, Dear White Women, Let's Get Uncomfortable Talking About Racism, out now from the Collective Book Studio. As they mentioned on their website, darewhitewomen.com, it is absolutely possible for more white people to meaningfully engage with stories, history, and actions and be involved in building a more equitable society. Sarah and Misasha have put out a call to more white people and white women in particular to join the action, and their new book is filled with short targeted chapters filled with historical context, personal stories and actionable items. And now just a bit more about our authors before we dive into our conversation tonight. You can read their full bios by clicking the link in the chat. Misasha, based in the Bay Area, is a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia Law School and has been practicing litigator for over 15 years. She's passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the legal profession, as well as in her communities, and as a facilitator, writer, and speaker regarding issues of racial justice and children. Misasha, who is half white and half Japanese, is married to a black man and is a proud mom of two very active multiracial young boys. Sarah lives in Denver and helps build community and connection through conscious conversations which she does as a facilitator, TEDx speaker, writer, and consultant. After graduating from Harvard and working at Goldman Sachs, she pursued the science and techniques of well-being and is a certified life coach and author of the book, Flex Mom. Sarah is half white and half Japanese, married to a white Canadian man, and is raising their two white presenting girls to be compassionate, thoughtful advocates. Moderating the event today is Dr. Anu Tarnath, who brings both passion and expertise to her work as a speaker, facilitator, author, and educator. A University of Washington professor for the past 20 years, she teaches about race, gender, equity, and global literatures. As a DEI and racial equity consultant, she offers coaching, training, facilitation, and other types of partnerships. Her book, Beyond Guilt Trips, Mindful Travel in an Unequal World, was selected a winner of the Newsweek Future of Travel Awards and Storytelling, a finalist for four book awards, including the Washington State Book Award, and named Fodor's Travels 13 Books to Inspire Your Travels, and Oprah Magazine's 20, Best 26 Travel Books of All Times. Dr. Anu and her book have been profiled in Newsweek, Mindful, and National Geographic magazines, to name a few. If you have any questions for the authors, please add them to the Q&A field at any time, and we will get to them after the moderated portion. As a reminder, university bookstore events are a safe and inclusive space, and we ask that all participants engage in a respectful manner, or you will be removed from the event. That being said, we encourage lots of activity in the chat field, sharing of your own stories and experiences and supportive comments. And now I will turn over the virtual stage to Anu, Sarah, and Misasha. Thank you so much, Grace. That was a beautiful introduction of all of us. 
And a really nice characterization uh, of this book, Dear White Women, Let's Get Uncomfortable Talking About Racism. Uh, Sarah and Misasha, welcome. So nice to be in conversation with you both today. I'm so grateful to be here. Likewise, it's such an honor. How do you two know each other? And how is it that you have come to collaborate not only on this book, but on your podcast? Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, I can answer the first part of that for sure. We met 25 years ago. Um, oh, and nice. we wouldn't not have known it at the time, but it was really sort of related to what we're doing now. We met as we walked out of a racial identity conversation. Um, uh, we're both, as as Grace mentioned in the introduction, we're both biracial, we're both Japanese and white. And it was a meeting, the HAPA meeting, which they labeled as the Half Asian People's Association. And so uh, as that meeting, as we left that meeting, we ran into each other and have been friends ever since. How do you go from friends to colleagues? to co-podcasters, to co-writers. Being friends is one thing. Working together on a sentence is something very different, no? It really is. Mm -hmm. um, and first, I have to say that as the um, granddaughter of a former UW history professor, it is like, um, you know, and spending a lot of time in the university bookstore, it's such a pleasure to be here um, and talking to you, a UW professor as well. Um, you know, that is a tough transition. I think that's something that we get asked a lot. Um, you know, how do we go from best friends and keep that relationship, right, and be collaborators in work that is often really difficult and very personal. Right. Um, and I think that on some level, it comes out of the conversations and the friendship that we have built over these 25 years. because. You know, we, as Sarah mentioned, we met in college, but we've had a lot of years since that point. And your conversations change naturally in friendships as you get yes. older, right? And and when we, you know, found life partners and then when we um, had kids, right, those conversations shifted a lot, especially with kids. And I think we realized that, um, you know, the fears that I had for my boys, um, you know, in particular, that they would walk out of our house and not come back um, solely because of the color of their skin were not only different than the fears that Sarah has for her daughters, um, but also very different um, from the fears that we were hearing in the circles that we were traveling in. And being biracial, um, we were able to sort of and have been able to float through spaces that have been predominantly white. Um, and so we knew what conversations were happening and what conversations were not happening in those spaces. And so we both love um, talking and we both loved writing. And we thought, you know, um, this podcasting thing sounds sounds mm -hmm. great. Um, this might be a way to shift those conversations in those spaces that we know so well and broaden um, those conversations away from what has always been the dominant narrative in this country to be mm -hmm. inclusive and to really take everyone, um, everyone's humanity, everyone's hopes, everyone's fears into account. So we started the podcast with that simple belief and thought, you know, maybe five people, all of them related to us would listen. Um, and then we realized that um, in 2020, the world had changed a lot for a variety of reasons, but there was, you know, a lot that we had to say that we wanted to make sure um, was getting to people. And mm -hmm. so the book was really born from that desire um, and, you know, also very personal desire on both of our parts. Um, and we wrote that between November 2020 and the January 6th insurrection. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, to, you know, traverse this whole friendship cycle, business partner cycle, podcast um book work together has been such it, it's been such a gift i think mm -hmm. for me to have a partner like sarah in this work because it's it is so tough and we need to lean on each other um mm -hmm. and support each other but you know that's the message that we have is is just like the work you do um dr Anu, so important that um, we want to make sure we can get it out to everyone there's so many pieces of what you're saying sasha that i just want to lift up and make sure that we don't lose in our conversation. One is the very personal nature of what it means to step into this work for not only both of you, but for folks who are watching us here, 
for people that we know, this is not simply intellectual labor. Engaging in conversations about race and power and harm and history and what it means to live better now with that kind of hope and dignity cannot just simply be up here. You have to feel it here, right? We have to do something with our hands, of course, but we have to feel it here in a very visceral way. And I was struck in the book where you both spend a considerable time sharing the stakes of the project for each of you and also claiming not only simply your identities, but claiming your lineage in terms of this project, right? It says this is not just, again, coming in and writing something uh, from one component of your life. It is a very holistic rendering of power, history, who you are, what your family looks like, who they are not. As you said, Misasha, what conversations you're part of, what you're not hearing. All of that is within the first, say, 40, 50 pages of your book, right? Uh, Sarah, tell us a little bit more about why you all decided to begin the book with such a personal lens for looking at both of you. Tell us. I mean, I think at our core belief is that a lot of this work needs to be driven by that personal connection mm -hmm. to it you know, talking about race and racism and any of the isms basically are, are uncomfortable for everybody. And when you don't have that, like as a human being, we sort of tend to shy away from those things that we're uncomfortable with. And so to make this a sustainable, more authentic mm -hmm. form of engagement, I think it's really important for everybody to really think about why they care because otherwise it does live in this intellectual sphere. Mm -hmm. And then when you hit the first bump in the road, you sort of go, well, I don't have to do this. I'm just going to back off. And so I think that was where we wanted to also explain our why and, mm -hmm. and share that we can all look at our own history and our own lineage and our own, you know, involvement in our own identities and, and our friendship circles and find those whys by really looking inwards first as we start this work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Ms. Asha also mentioned the fact that you all have known each other for so long. And Sarah, you mentioned, you know, coming out of a, a Hapa meeting many years ago. Uh, I am also noticing in my life that the friendships that I've been able to share with people over time have not only given us a sense of grounding, but they also give you a like a landing place to come back from traveling through different ideas, right? Somebody who knew me when I was 23 uh, is knows me from a very different time of my life and my intellectual and sort of holistic development than, you know, now as a middle-aged woman from in a very different part of her life. And I love that your collaboration is punctured, I mean, is punctuated by these moments of love and friendship and families blending together because you've got that place to land. You can dream, you can think, and you have that beautiful place to land. What does that place to land look like for both of you as you are struggling, I'm sure, through figuring out how to work a podcast, how to draw in listeners, how to write together, how to get a book published? None of this is easy work. It's passionate work, of course, but none of it is easy. And so how has that landing place of a long friendship and love between you all how has that helped the process of the projects that you've been working on? Yeah, I, I don't think it could be possible really without each other, um, mm. at least from my perspective, because I, um, I think we balance each other in, in a lot mm. of ways, um, you know, and, and we grew up together really, because when we, you know, going to college together is, is kind of when you find a voice, right? But that might not be the voice to what you were saying, um, you know, that we have now in our in our mid 40s, right? It is a different voice. Um, and it's a stronger voice, I think now, but, but to have someone who has known you for that long, um, and can also be very honest with yeah. you, because I think a lot of and a, a lot of the barriers around having these uncomfortable conversations is people want to be nice, right? And nice is a construct 
of you know a, a white supremacist culture and it's really designed to keep people in line in a certain way um and i think we focus really on kindness right kindness versus mm -hmm. niceness and there is a there is a difference um although sometimes we're taught that it's the same um, but i think that honesty um, where we can be brutally honest with each other and say mm -hmm. you know um i don't think this is where we want to take this um, or I need to set this boundary right now because I I need this time and space. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think on both of those, those are sort of two ends of the same spectrum, but um, both of those ends are so important in terms of making this work sustainable as well. I don't know, Sarah, what do you think? Um, yeah, I could not do this with anybody <laughs> but you. I mean, I, I think that's one of those things where one of the things I've always loved about our friendship is the lack of judgment. It's it's acceptance, it's knowing, it's love. And I think without that, because we all as, as people, I think, go through waves of confidence and less confidence, right? Like we go through phases in life and to have someone who will catch me no matter where in the cycle I'm mm -hmm. at nice. and be... Um, honest, knowing that I'm strong enough to have trust in the friendship and trust in, in my life and her life and, and our, our truths that it's a, it's a gift. And it's, um, that's, it's, it's wonderful to have this in our life. And I think really form the foundation for being able to do this work. I mean, I was thinking as you were both speaking about recently, I put a post up on Instagram and it was like, mm, actually, and, and, you know, it was like, we had a conversation behind the scenes and we wound up handling it and redirecting the whole post. And to be able to talk through those moments, you know, in the work is important. And as you said, Misasha, about boundaries. And I think we regularly check each other on like, is everyone getting enough sleep, exercise, all these fundamental human things, mm -hmm. because this work is so personal and it is so difficult and it's unrelenting. I mean, even today in the news, how many things have we read today that we're having to process and have feelings about and, yeah. and reflect out to society? So how do we do that in a way that lets us keep going? And I think that's that's been really like a gift to have this partnership together. I still laugh when people call us business partners because I mean, I, we float through so many levels of conversation from forever ago, from shoes to art news articles to, you know, all the things. If you can't talk about shoes with someone you're writing with, I'm not sure what kind of is, right? So that's just my sense too. Um, I really, really appreciate the ways that both of you are framing, you know, the kind of ways that we come into this work, right? If we are trying to literally rethink who we are, not only on our own, but with others in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our families, in our societies, we are going to have to do this work all in. And yet all in can very quickly lead to, I'm out, I got no, I got no more in me. Right? All in leads to burnout. All in leads to frayed nerves. All in leads to all kinds of woundedness in, in us that never gets healed. Right? And so I think, you know, it's really great for me as someone who does some of the work that you all are engaged with as well, for me to hear from you two and also be in conversation with others about, yes, this work is relentless. And we have a short time on earth with one another, what does that mean? What does that mean to be here together, overlapping in this moment, contentious, vicious, as well as joyful and beautiful? How do we use our gifts together to make things a little bit better for a few more of us right now, right here? Because if I go under, and if you go under, right, because we think the work, the work is relentless, which it is, that's neither good for me or you or the movements, right? And trying to find that balance as authors, teachers, people with small people, people taking care of elders, people as part of activism, of organizing, of communities, that is a really challenging kind of line to walk, no? You have to be honest with one another and with yourself, right? So being able so. to hear you kind of check each other uh, reminds me to be able to check myself a little bit better on this too, right? Yes, Sarah, please. Oh, and I was going to say that that it is also 
something that we want to have people understand about this work too, which is that it doesn't have to be so much that you can't step your foot into it. Like there are these shifts that we can all make on a day-to-day basis in our own spheres that are already in existence. And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, I I think about some people who say I have too much. I can't, I can't put, take this on additionally, right? Like it feels like they're wearing DE and I work and they have to add that, but it's actually about just changing what you're already doing. And I think looking at it that way helps all of us make it more sustainable as well. And, and it keeps us from saying, oh, it's too much. I can't start. I don't know where to start. And that's one of the really interesting things about your book, right? You come in, your book says very clearly, we are here to walk you through not only some of the big uh, kind of unanswerable questions about race and power and history and racism, but to also guide us towards some very practical applications of how we can make some small change in our life right now, right? Can you tell us a little bit about why you structured your book the way you did? What were you seeing in other books that you felt you wanted to do perhaps differently or more deeply or more intentionally? Why, why, why did this book turn out the way it did? So that's a great question. Um, You know, I I think first the overall to the point um, that you were talking about with the practical tips in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, When we wrote this book, we had already been hearing from people who had sort of bought all the books um, in in June of 2020 and then, you know, may or may not have read the books. Um, But those books, (laughs) right, they bought them. Um, So But those books are really intellectual, a lot of them, um, which is important, right? It's important to understand theory um, as well. Um, But I think it it left a lot of people with the question of, okay, so what do I do? Mm -hmm. And when that is not clearly spelled out, then, you know, you read the book and then you get busy. And also this was still, you know, in 2020 and 2021, and we are still dealing with COVID and so many other challenges and people to what Sarah was saying earlier, feel overwhelmed and feel like Mm -hmm. this is something I I cannot do. Um, So we wanted to really simplify it and say, look, here is in each chapter, um, here is some, here's a story, right? Here is a narrative um, in which we tell you why this particular issue is so important, right? Because of this this personal why. Then we tell you a little bit about the history that behind this issue, which you may or may not have learned in school, possibly not, um, especially, right? Um, You know, and then we move on to ACT, which is the section, that third section that says, okay, you've heard the story, you, understand the history um, a little bit more. And now these are the things that you can do armed with what you know now. And so we wanted Mm -hmm. to make those connections very clear so that people could feel, um, you know, okay and feel like, oh, we we have, I have the agency to act, even in a small way, you know, if it's talking to my school about what's being taught um, in the curriculum, right? If it's, um, you know, looking at, like committees at work and saying like, who is on our hiring committee? Who is on, you know, our recruiting committee? Who is on the partnership committees or, you know, the promotion committees? Um, I'm a lawyer, so I always go with a, with a law firm um, structure. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and so to, to give people those little prompts throughout their life. And, you know, the book is also, besides those mini chapters, it's structured in three larger sections, which is yes. being white in America which sort of provides, um, you know, background and thoughts around a lot of the issues that we heard come up as sort of questions and challenges to the white experience experience in America. And then Mm -hmm. the second section is being black in America, because fundamentally, the black experience in America is significantly different than and is foundational to understand um, once you if you really want to look at systemic racism in this country. And then from there, we move on to the third section, which is being a non-black person of color in America. And so we have chapters, um, you know, on the China flu, this is in heavy air quotes, um, or, you know, the Asian monolith or the immigrant experience or the Native American experience in this country, just to give people little sort of bite-sized knowledge, a knowledge base, 
and a way to change those conversations in their own spheres, small things, but things that they can implement immediately after reading. Hmm. Sarah, tell us a little bit about the title and how people are responding to the title, Dear White Women, Let's Get Uncomfortable Talking About Racism. Yeah, I think the, the Dear White Women part is definitely the part that gets people's attention. And we purposely chose, I mean, it's the title of our platform too, right? Of our, of our podcast. And we purposely chose to stick with it um, because it is not comfortable necessarily to be, to be honest, but we didn't want to pull the wool over anybody's eyes because talking about racism is not comfortable, as I said earlier, for anybody. But one of the things, you know, the, the range of responses has been fascinating, Misasha. Mm -hmm. I think you, right? Like we've had people from one end saying, calling us racist mm -hmm. because we named people white. Mm -hmm. And, and to that, I think it is a level of discomfort because people aren't used to being called white, but they call people Asian or black or, you know, all, all of these other races, but we don't often talk about white and being white and whiteness as much. And so that definitely caught some people off guard, but really the reason we called it this is because women in particular have so much power, power that we don't necessarily as a society acknowledge about women, whether it's you know, if you look at our absolute numbers, the, the voting power that we might have or the power we have in our workplace or in our children's schools or at our kitchen table, like women have so much influence and white women in particular also have the like extra part of it where you both understand what it is like to be white, but also have a little bit more empathy because of sexism. You sort of understand what it's like to say, not be able to wear whatever you want as you walk out the door at dusk, or just that sense of fear that some people might have based on how they show up in the world. And so we wanted, as Misasha said earlier, to really reach this group of people that we were able to, you know, we know has so much potential of influence and also that we are so familiar with because of our circles and our friends and, and the places that we've been able to sort of, you know, be part of and, and notice. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Misasha, you want to answer a little bit more. I know often you take that question. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I we got I, I got asked that question by my mother, who is a white woman. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because it, it I think that um, it can come off as confrontational, and I and and but that's not the intention um, at all. I think we, you know, to what Sarah was saying, um, this is a group that has a large influence that mm -hmm. is often undervalued. Um, and if this particular group um, can use that power that comes with being white in America and being women, um, that would be something. I mean, that would be actually game changing for how our country works. And um, but we but that group has largely not been able to organize. And so there and and you know we know that those conversations aren't always happening or the the conversations that happen sometimes when people recognize that we are biracial um, are different than the conversations that happen when people assume that we're not mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know I, I think that the more that we can continue to have these conversations the more that we can make people ask why did you call it that you know the the and i think that's you know partially why we want people to ask that question because we want to be able to tell them why and the more that we can continue to spread the why um the 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 just i i can't even fathom sort of the power that mm -hmm. and the differential that power shift that could happen that's interesting that folks find the title confrontational you know i found it really gentle a very gentle title uh and a, a gentle read uh, you're not, you're not sugarcoating things, but you're also not saying because you are white or because you have X or Y types of privileges, you are unsalvageable and the movement needs you not. That's certainly not your take. It is absolutely the opposite. It is because you hold so much power, because your life whether you've noticed or not, has been greased by various privileges, historic and institutional and cultural and social, right? We'd like to 
A, help you see that, B, give you some history and some context for why that came to be, and C, move you through that, that paralysis and guilt that we're often swimming in to seeing how you can actually use some of this knowledge to make a little bit of changes in your life, right? I found it to be a very gentle and inviting read, actually. Part, maybe partly because I do some of this and I, you know, I, maybe I've read lots of actual confrontational work, <laughs> uh, but there's something really accessible about this book that I think many of your readers might appreciate. Have you been hearing that? We have, that has been so rewarding. That was our intention. Yes. And sometimes you never know how it'll land, right? But, but that has been the incredible feedback that we've been given about the tone, about how welcoming and warm it is. Nice. It's not shaming anybody. Um, because there's also the truth, which is that, you know, in our country, history is not taught evenly throughout the states, throughout the cities. And so sometimes we just don't know, we're not taught. And so it is what it is. And we want to provide this baseline level of education so that we can all have a level playing field from which to build. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, we worked hard on that tone and we're really, really pleased when people oh, right. reflect that back to us. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I have a book as well, and I thought a lot about what tone do I want to offer in it? I think a lot about my own tone in my classes or in facilitations. I'm sure you do, you both do as well. And I'm learning more and more that <clears throat> the tone for the ways that I'm trying to welcome people into the conversation might be gentle, might be inviting. It doesn't necessarily water down the fury that I might have, the frustration, or the passion that I bring to this work. Those are two very different things. My fury for what is, my frustration and sorrow for also what is, my hopefulness for how it could be, all of that can be at fever pitch. And yet, how I choose to welcome people in to conversations doesn't always have to reflect that uh, in such a one-to-one -one way. There's a craft in welcoming people into a book, a podcast, a conversation, a class, a meeting, right? Which uh, sometimes is really hard to share with folks that mm, might be only seeing it from the other side, right? Both of you are facilitators and both of you have Share, helped share space with others and have helped shape spaces for others. What do you notice about the ways that you invite people in, right? What kind of work do you have to do to invite people in so you can do the best work together? Tell me a little bit about that. I'm so curious to hear. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that you know, I loved how you put that, you know, that everything else can sort of be at a fever pitch and the tone that you take is is um, is one of welcoming. And, you know, it, because that really, to me, speaks to the desire to have actual change happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I think that um, I, I think now about a lot of the work um, in talking to schools and parents um, and um you know, being asked um, questions of parent by by parents of white children um, that, as a parent of kids of boys who are seen by the world as black, some of those questions are really difficult for me mm. to answer because, mm. um, you know, I, I and I'll give you an example. Um, I, there was a mom who had said, like, I I really of a eight-year-old, I think, seven or eight-year-old, and said, I, I really don't want to talk about racism with my kids because I don't want them, um, you know, to be traumatized. And so when she says this, and I'm looking, I mean, I'm looking at her through the Zoom screen because this is, you know, and, um, and I'm just thinking, like, I, you know, I have to talk to my kids about this regularly so that they can survive outside of our house. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there is an extreme privilege in, in saying that, but, but how I, I have to answer her is, is not, you know, and I, I 
did say that there is privilege in in you saying this, but at the same time, it didn't just end there, right? We mm. we need to talk about, and I'm having her see me as a mother as well, right? So we tap into, I think, tapping into the humanity, right? And, and seeing the commonalities that we have, right? We're both mothers. We mm. both don't want our kids to be traumatized, right? So how are we gonna get to a society where that is true for everyone, right? Mm. And so I think that once we, can align on you know what we have in common fundamentally because we have so many things in common um, and but then when, when we lean into those commonalities we see the difference right and we see how that difference can be so harmful mm -hmm. and how we can so that's I think that's the balance that and hopefully I explain that um, mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense but that's sort of the balance between sometimes what's happening in my head and then how I'm trying to translate that into a conversation that's going to lead towards change or at least more thinking right more thinking about what is the experience that is broader than my own um right, right. yeah i love that last line what is the experience that is broader than my own um more and more recently a line that becomes really important for me is i am but one life in this world I am but one story in this world. And there's a humility in knowing that my experience certainly matters. And yet, I'm just one. I'm just one of so many others who might have some commonalities with me and so many others whose lives look so different than mine. And what's my role in being able to hold the complexity of what I just said? Right? How do we do that? How do we develop those muscles in ourselves? Right? I, I frequently think about this kind of work as not just I did it or I, I, I'm now woke or I checked a box or any of those kind of easier things that we uh, would like to do, but it's more about strengthening that kind of entire musculature of resilience, staying in conversations that are discomforting, being okay with my discomfort, knowing that I don't know everything creating more spaces to be humble and have more humility. All of those are muscles that we practice. We don't often know how to do any of that. And our culture doesn't certainly teach us how to do much of, any, much of that, right? It teaches us how to one up each other. It teaches us how to divorce ourselves from what's going on. It teaches us to swipe quickly if we're, un if we're uncomfortable in any way. And so, being able to stay in that conversation, whether it's in real life or whether it's in Zoom, and to say, oh, so when I say I don't want my child to be traumatized, there's sweetness in it, and I'm also doing a disservice to my child, to myself, to my child, and to your kids, and to our society, right? There's something really incredible about being able to use that commonality to stretch, right? I want to ask you both a little bit um, about who you are. I, I shared earlier that the first part of the book uh, kind of grounds both of you and your identities and your families and your stakes and uh, positionality. It's also really important to notice that the three of us are non-Black people of color. The three of us are racial equity, DEI practitioners, uh, and we convene spaces in which we are non-Black people of color, right? What is it, what are some of the thoughts and the conversations that you both had as non-Black people of color, Kappa women, working on a book that is titled Dear White Women, and also having a big middle section that set, that is around the experience of African Americans and Black people. Share a little bit about that, please. I mean, I definitely had the, am I allowed to be here doing this? And I think I even say that at the beginning of the book. Um, I had my own sort of racial awareness journey almost through the course of the beginning of the book and, and into earlier this year as well, where I spent personally, the first half of my life under my Japanese mother's roof, eating Japanese food, going to Japanese school, like I was very clearly living my Asian self. And mm -hmm. then the second half of my life, right after my white father passed away and I was married to a white man and living in Arizona and Colorado, which by all measurements are very predominantly white states, 
really floating heavily in these white circles. And it was really only when the Atlanta shootings happened. And a friend of mine called the next morning saying, look, I never thought, I, I knew I had to call black friends through all of these events, but I never thought I'd have to call you as an Asian woman, how are you doing? And at that moment being seen in a predominantly white place by a white man, friend who I've done some of this work with as an Asian woman meant the world to me. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had finally come home to really embracing my own identity and being able to say like, I do, feel comfortable now. Like, and I was missing that part of myself and I was suppressing my own identity. And how has that played into all of this work? And so there's that part of my identity and, and my journey that led, you know, that I was grappling with even during the writing of this book. Um, and I feel so much more grounded in that. And I think there was also a lot of conversations that we mm -hmm. had where we spoke with our friends of color, because I don't think either of us presumed to tell how black people felt with that, like from our perspective, right? That had to come from the stories from our friends, from our, our families, from our, you know, just our community colleagues. I think all of that is where we tapped into it. And I mean, Sasha, you can talk more specifically about that second section, but, um, you know, I think we really were mindful Mm. of sharing these stories with respect and not on behalf of anybody, if that makes sense, if that's the right languaging that I'm trying to find here. Mm. It's, it's subtle and tricky, you know, right? We say, use your voice, use your privilege, use what platform you have to bring in the voices of others who might not have the same platform that you do. How we use that voice is very tricky, right? Very tricky. Miss Sasha, yes. add on, please. Yeah, it's definitely tricky. And I mean, having um, my husband who is black, um, I think there has not been a day in this house that we have not talked about race in some form. Um, and he has also been a big check um, on me. Um, and, you know, in writing, this book, and in particular, that second section, um, it was something that to, you know, your point about that line being very fine and difficult, right? I, um, not being black, um, you know, we didn't want to speak for black people. And so, but some of the history that is out there, some of the history mm -hmm. that we know was not being taught in schools, um, you know, some of that is so important and to share the narratives that we know um, and, and have, you know, people have trusted us to tell, um, to share those and then to talk. Um, and, you know, those act sections were really written with after talking to people, black people asking, mm -hmm. what is it? What is it that would make the imp like the impact and the change? And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations in particular with a number of uh, black people in my life, in particular, my husband about our voices in this work. Mm -hmm. um, and because there are different reactions around having our voices in this work. And he was, he has always been very adamant that um, there needs to be all voices in this work. And everyone has a different perspective and reaches different people. And so how you reach the people is very important, definitely. But to silence voices um, means that you're also losing that opportunity to make change. Um, as long as those voices are authentic and true and working with that purpose of really making change and not speaking for people, mm -hmm. but helping to see that change happen, you know, not a attempting to assume what communities need, but really leaning into what, you know, people are saying that they need. Um, and that, yeah, it is, it is something that I think we navigate every podcast episode, you know, writing this book all the time, um, mm -hmm. and especially having a platform with this name. Um, you know, it's always top of mind, but you know, I'm, I'm proud of what we did in this book because I think we worked really hard to, to find that line and to hold it um, mm -hmm. in the way that was very authentic. Um, mm -hmm. 
yeah, in our voice. To find that line and to hold it and to also know that sometimes that line shifts depending on the context. So true. Right? Or in the moment or in the, in the particular cultural moment that we might be in. Right? Mm. Uh, one of the participants in the audience has asked, is this a book that parents can use to have DEI conversations with their children? Do you have any advice about having these conversations as a family? Great questions. Yes, I think for sure it's a book that can help parents who want to read it first to get some grounding and, and understanding. Um, and I've heard from a few people actually that they're reading it with their teenage kids together and they're going through it because it is it is an appropriate book. It's okay to read this with kids of that level. You know, when it comes to families for younger kids, I think Misasha and I often talk about the power of books. And there are so many other books that when children are little, you can start just centering not white characters or animal characters in your kids' books, but look at characters of color. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's other types of books that you can read as a family, you know, when the kids are little, because this is not for, for you know, the five-year-olds in the crowd, I don't think, but from the teenage levels on, absolutely. And in fact, we've had people do that or, or groups of moms getting together and having it as book clubs, that sort of thing. Yeah, this would be a great book club book. Absolutely, right? I can see it as a really interesting circle book for language arts classes in high school. Um, it sets such a good introduction to some of the most hot button issues and conversations that at least when I see students in college, they say, we want to participate, but we're not quite sure how. We want to be able to have thoughtful, cogent responses, but sometimes what we feel is like we're just parroting what we've seen on social media. And I'm not quite sure how to even kind of pause some of that noise to think, wait, what do I even think about this? What's coming up for me? How does what happened landed on who I am? And how does it raise all kinds of hard questions? And how does it raise all kinds of things and passion in me? Uh, my students have had so little opportunity to do that. And the more time that we, or, or the more opportunities that we give young people to be able to sit with each other themselves with, I think, a smart book to say, hey, how's that landing for you? Did you know this? Did you learn this? How come you didn't? What does that mean for you now? How do you want to, what do you want to do differently about this now that we know a little bit more about redlining or now that we know a little bit more about how race, uh, how children understand race from a very young age? What did you notice? I mean, the kind of questions that you ask in this book, I think could be so applicable for teens onward. Right? I'm really glad that it's being taken up uh, in book clubs and in other kinds of groups. I can imagine uh, it really growing in popularity uh, as more people become aware of it. I have, we have another really thoughtful question here. Have you found that talking with white women about their privilege and power has landed differently with them from both of you? Meaning, are they more open? as it is coming from you both as non-Black or Brown women. I ask this as a Brown woman who has been told that, quote, I make it about race when I'm attempting to start the conversation about that with white women. There's a lot in that question, right? There's there. a whole lot. There's so many layers to that question. Uh, thank yeah. you, participant, for offering that. Yeah, I, I love that question. I think um, it is a really thoughtful question. Um, and Sarah, I'm curious to hear um, what you're going to say too. But um, I think yes, 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 um, in a lot of ways. Um, I have heard people, um, when I've talked about my kids, I have heard people say that they have a like a mental disconnect between seeing who I am and then me talking about raising black sons, right? I think mm -hmm. um, yeah. that it is both um, easier for some people to hear and harder for some people to hear. So it's not it's not a clear um, mm -hmm. 
one way or the other. I do think that um, Sarah and I are, are um, more accepted in certain spaces than we would be um, if we were black or brown, for sure. And mm -hmm. um, and people are more receptive in certain ways than they were they than they would be otherwise. Um, definitely, I think that. Um, knowing white spaces as well as we do and having been considered white in white spaces um, by people who don't know our our um, history creates this level of familiarity whether that's right or not um, mm, yeah. that has been something that i think um, has helped us with addressing this particular group um, mm. in certain ways i think it does it does land, the reason I asked Sarah what she thinks is because I think it lands a little differently sometimes when we talk about our kids because um, our parenting experience is different and I can't tell. Um, sometimes I think that that is a barrier um, at times um, mm -hmm. when I talk about my boys versus Sarah talking about her girls. I don't know, maybe that's what I'm perceiving and that might not be true. Mm -hmm. It's such a, an uncomfortable truth, isn't it, this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that we will, the same message can be received differently coming from different faces. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, Misasha, you talk about people saying the disconnect between your face and raising black boys, because I think what gets in the way is often these stereotypes we have about people, like say, say if, you know, you're a brown woman is, is how you described yourself. Uh, I think it's Cynthia, you know, there's this, there's all these stereotypes about people with dark, women with darker skin and, and whether it's a black woman, a brown woman, like the, you know, there's the, the angry black woman trope, for example. So then the person has to potentially not be able to express her full range of emotions, otherwise would just be seen as a character caricature of herself. And so there are all these barriers that come to, to expressing their people's truths based on, on how they're being seen. And I think um, that sucks. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it is interesting to think about how this message is seen because, I mean, I think at the same time I've been told, you know, not everything's about race and I'm kind of like, well, it well. kind of is uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways, but we're seeing almost, I think my kiddos, for example, who present as white and, and my, I have a, a preteen and when she is, says then I share some of the stories that she has, you know, participated in, whether she's speaking up against someone who made an anti-Asian comment or doing whatever, it's like, wow, great job. Like she's seen as this advocate versus someone who's defending themselves. And that's a different energy, you know? And somehow we applaud the people who stand up for others, but if they're standing up for themselves, it's seen in a different energy and in a different way. Again, when it's the same message. And so, you know, to the extent that we can use our facial appearance to continue to spread the message and hopefully get it into people. Once people are aware of that pattern, they may start to shift their reaction. They're more conscious of their own like knee jerk reaction when people are saying the same thing, looking a different way. But until we get to that point where we can reach everybody and, and sort of open that level of consciousness, I think that's why we, again, advocate for more white people, people who can fly in these circles to, to, be aware and speak up and and use their voices whenever possible to make more people aware of that difference and how the message is perceived. Yeah, what I really appreciate from both of your comments is, you know, this underlying notion of how do you use what you have to be able to really push allyship and accomplish, uh, to be the accomplice that we need to be to shift the conversations that can ask more critical questions, that can dip into the discomfort, that can stay angry when they need to be, that can hold the frustration. Those are the conversations that are more raw and real and truthful. And we will have to be more raw and real and truthful to ourselves and to one another if we actually wanna change anything, right? You can't bypass the rawness, you can't bypass the feeling and say, put the feeling a little bit, that's a little too much for me. Just, just tell me the tip, just tell me the tool, just tell me what I need, right? That rawness to be able to sit with it, coming from me, who I am, or coming from either of you, who you are, or coming from our participant and who she is, right? That rawness is read so differently based on who we are 
and how it lands on others, right? And if I, as a non-Black person of color, am able to have access to people in different sectors because they find my message, quote, gent gentle, how do I get myself in those spaces and do my work well so I can move the conversation where it needs to, right? You think I'm gentle? Okay, fine, bring me in. You, you think I'm easier? Bring me in and then let's see, let's push, let's push, let's push, right? So that's what I think a lot about kind of being that kind of ally and accomplice in that sort of a way. And that's what I'm hearing in your responses too. If they are, e are more easily kind of assuaged by who that face is, how do I use that to push the conversation, right? This is uh, another question that we have. Um, do you have any advice on how someone can use their privilege to be a good ally while not taking away from the agency of BIPOC people? How can bystanders help best? Great questions. I mean, I think those can be two scenarios. You know, the, the bystander is, is one part, but I wanted to just address that first part about being a good ally while not taking away the agency. Yeah. You know, I think if, I, I still think of any time people do this work where, where say, for example, um, you know, it, it goes back to what you said earlier, Misasha, this idea of not speaking for somebody. It's if we can get our foot in the door, say, in an organization, and they want to know about the experience of people of color. Well, then why not if you're being, you know, if you're the speaker at that point, why not bring in a panel of people who can speak about their personal experiences, and intentionally open up that space and create that space that allows BIPOC people to share their own stories as opposed to you mm -hmm. saying, well, I heard this from a friend, mm -hmm. right? So I think we can use our opportunities to, to give opportunity to others. Right, right. Yeah. Ms. Sasha, add on. Yeah, I think it's also really um, important to know yourself, right? And know who you are and what your biases are, because I think that um, a lot of times it's easy to, to really want to make change and, you know, push into spaces that you might not understand because you haven't done that reflection first. Um, and I think that doing that reflection, knowing those biases and then listening, listening, I think is also a really important part. I was going to add on, but I think listening full stop sometimes, mm -hmm. um, is, is important um, and then acting, right? I think that um, listening to understand, not just listening to, you know, make your point, um, wait till someone stops speaking and then make your point, right? But listening to really understand, um, you know, that's where I think the allyship comes in, right? And then, and then not just ending with listening, right? Because it is great to listen to, and I think to be informed and listen, but then, to act, but in a way that is actually helping the communities that you are looking for, I think that you are in. And I think in terms of being a bystander too, that that is, you are reading the situation, right? And bystander, being a bystander is a really important role. And I always say that, you know, when my kids leave our house, they are in everyone else's hands, right? And if you are one of those hands, right, then you, then you're, you're giving a voice in a sense where my kids might not have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, but you but you're not speaking for them if they are if they are able to use their voice, but you are you are using your voice in ways when they can't be heard. And so I right. think that's that's the line for me on that. Mm -hmm. There's a grace in being able to say, can you care for my babies? Society has cared for yours. Are you able to care for my babies? Right? Are you able to care? Are we able to care for others who are not us? I mean, this is a big question that I think we've been asking throughout the pandemic, right? What is public health? Whose safety matters more? Uh, whose dignity matters more? All, all of these kind of big questions that the pandemic just sort of threw up. Yes, yeah, Sarah, tell you. Yeah, well, I, I, and to that point, I think sometimes when we talk about bystanders or, or being a good ally, you know, it doesn't have to always be in mixed company. I think some of the best things that 
white people can do is when you're in those white circles and someone's making a racist or joke or an inappropriate comment, stop and say like, what do you mean by that? You know, some of the, this work, especially if, if we're doing it deeply from that place of heartfelt connection is not the stuff that you're going to share on social media. It's like in that real human moment where you are, are digging deep and just interrupting a pattern. Right. And so I think that is another place where we want to have people look out for opportunities to be a good active ally. Right. And I love that comment that this isn't about the performativity of it. This isn't about, do you know what I did? I'm so great, right? I'm that checkbox. I'm that woke. It's not about that. It's about if we want to live a more dignified life as a multiracial community, if we actually think that all people's lives matter and some of the most impacted people's lives have been so diminished by harm and fear and oppression, and if that moves us to do something differently, what does that move us to do differently? What does that move us to do differently, right? We can't continue doing what we're doing and say we care. That's a big disconnect, right? And your book is showing some breadcrumbs from, I say that I care, I want to do something differently. And your book offers some pathways for people to explore for that. Right. Well, what fun to speak with you this evening. I have had another 73 questions in my mind. Uh, and one day I hope we can do a part two of this conversation. I feel like we're just getting started. No, uh, everyone go out and get dear white women. Let's get uncomfortable talking about racism. If you're a white woman, read it. If you're not a white woman, still read it. Uh, I think you can get a lot from this, uh, Sarah and me, Sasha. My thanks for this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This is wonderful. Oh, for that very powerful discussion. I'm happy to set up a round two whenever you are. <laughs> so right. awesome. this is That's definitely great. something we could talk about for, we have so much to talk about and yes. I'm so grateful for your book which gives people those actionable steps to make a difference. So thank you to our authors, Sarah Blanchard and Misasha Suzuki Graham for sharing your stories and your truths with us. And our gratitude to Dr. Anu Taranath for your insightful interview. And thank you to you, our audience, for participating in this important discussion. You may purchase copies of Dear White Women as well as Dr. Anu Taranath's Beyond Guilt Trips at University Bookstore using the links in the chat. On behalf of University Bookstore, I want to thank you all for spending an hour with us and a really good book. See you at our next event.